Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Biomed Device Center stage. We're so glad you're uh, continuing to be with us today. We have a, a really nice panel on something a little different, uh, design. Uh, we're going to be talking with some uh, engineers who have been working on award-winning designs uh, through our MDEA awards program. Uh, the focus today is on designing an elegantly simple med tech solution. So if you would please help me welcome our panelists and our moderator, Omar Ford, who's the managing editor of MD and DI. Good afternoon. My name is Omar Ford and I'm the managing editor of MDDI. Healthcare, as you know, is an incredibly complex industry so patients, providers, and other stakeholders are always looking for an opportunity to make things simpler. Today, we'll be talking with the Medical Design Excellence Awards finalists and winners to discuss how they streamlined, simplified, and stripped down their devices to make users' lives easier. The topics will include why simplicity trumps complexity when it comes to medical device design today. We will explore ways to distinguish which bells and whistles or worth including in a device, and which add-ons only serve to distract and disengage users. We'll also walk away with strategies to bring a less is more approach to your next medical device design project. And now, I'd like to introduce each of our panelists. If they could just say a little bit about themselves. Hi, my name is Anthony Abate, and I am a, the R&D Engineering and Design Advisor for Intersect ENT. I'm also the founding engineer. Um, I work on designing the implants, delivery systems, methods of manufacturing, um, IP, um, basically everything that's involved on a ground level to start a new concept. Hey, I'm Shannon Clark, CEO of UserWise. We're a 20-person human factors consultancy located in San Jose, California. Before founding UserWise uh, seven years ago, I worked at Intuitive Surgical and Abbott Laboratories, so I'm hoping I can speak a little bit about surgical robotics today. Um, and so keep UserWise in mind if you have any human factors needs. Hi, my name is Larry Shaw. Um, I'm the president of Knightsbridge Sleep Solutions. And uh, I brought a um, show and tell of, uh, this is a product that won uh, one of the design awards. Um, and this is what we do. I make a, a chin strap for uh, snoring. And it's useful also, useful also for um, uh, CPAP use to prevent mouth leaks. And I'll just give you a two minute demo into what it is. Um, before I do that, she's gonna hold my mic. Um, I'll give you a little background. So, chin straps are traditionally just a piece of die cut neoprene, and they wrap around the tip of your chin, and the angle of them is like this. And your jaw joint is right here. So that means that the force is directly into your jaw joint and backwards. And backwards means that it's narrowing your air passage. And into your jaw joint means there, there's no torque, because torque is 90 degrees to that, to rotate your jaw. So um, it's like the worst design possible. Um, and long-term use can cause joint damage, and you're relying on uh, increased friction in your joint. So this is our product, and I'll just show you what it is real quickly. Um, so, it's a full cap, and it's just got two bands, and the bands pass under the jaw rather than uh, around the tip of the chin, and there's one that's non-elastic, and this prevents your jaw from lowering, and then with a little bit of elastic force, gentle force upwards, it takes almost no force to keep your jaw lifted, uh, because it's in the right direction for torque, and then um, it's a nonlinear force. So that's what we do. And sure, back to you. Sure. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the MDEAs, and uh, it's, a incredible, it's an incredible program. I've had the chance to sit in uh, in the past and just kind of watch uh, the judges 
judge and look at each device. And I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And it's an arduous process as well. Um, I want to talk to the panel about this. I, I want to talk about the design trends seen during the MDEA awards program. And it seems as if simplicity ruled the day. Can you share how important simplif simplification and streamlining were during the process of your MDEA, MDEA entry product? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'll just speak to the DaVinci SP for a little bit. So sometimes simplicity is about uh, streamlining user workflows so that to the user it's very simple, but sometimes on the other side of things in the electromechanical design, it actually creates complexity. Um, and then there's also other conditions where you might achieve a very simplistic design, uh, you don't want to over-design something, uh, and it also achieves that user simplicity. Uh, but with the DaVinci SP, there was sort of a moment where it's like, okay, what do we do about these um, controllers where you insert the instruments through those controllers? Because historically, they're numbered, so you can kind of look at the numbers and see which instrument is in which. But with this new design, it doesn't really work to have a static number present. And so uh, based on user-centered design, it was decided to add uh, a monitor or a LCD output to every single controller for every single instrument. So there was a point of context and in context um, uh, information presented to the user for each and every instrument. So you can imagine that's a far more complex design to actually have a monitor, a screen, on every single insertion point for the instrument. And I think that that's a really uh, excellent example where actually the electromechanics became very complex, but the output to the user created this really streamlined experience where they didn't have any confusion about which instrument to remove at any given point. Um, I could speak to um, simplicity in design as far as, um, I guess, overall manufacturing and bringing a new concept to market, um, keeping things very simple on the ground level. Um, um, the device that I won an award for was a bioabsorbable drug-eluting implant, nasal implant. And um, there's a lot of moving targets um, on this specific product. Um, you have. Um, the substrate or the implant itself that's going to be requiring, it's had to stay opposed um, inside the sinuses. Um, there's also a drug that you could either um, put on the surface for diffusion or you can integrate it into the matrix of the implant itself. Um, and there's also um, the interface with the physician where they can easily take it out of the package and um, either insert it into the delivery system or place it into the patient with very little um, thought. It just kind of happens intuitively. And um, I think the part that I've noticed the most where simplicity makes sense is um, bringing this product to market, um, designing it on a level where um, you have to move quickly, you have to change things quickly, um, keeping things in that design kind of modular and separate from other things. Um, like for instance, when we first started doing the design, we thought about implanting the drug inside the, uh, or putting the drug inside the implant matrix, basically mixing it into that bioabsorbable polymer. And in the end, that really wasn't a good move. Um, we ended up coating the surface because you're worried about degradation rate of the polymer and you're also worried about um, um, release rate of the drug. And um, another part is loading these thing in, things into the delivery system, um, sterilization. Um, but if I can say keeping the design simple, um, I wanted to really keep it simple in the beginning. For instance, I wanted to make it all one piece, the implant itself one piece. And nowadays it's five pieces. The design that's on the market is five pieces total. And that was actually simpler than doing it in one piece. So um, yeah, it's just keeping an eye on what really helps you to make the most traction, gives you the best um, opportunity to change things along the way without reinventing the wheel and you can deliver exactly what the patient, whoever the patient is. Uh, with regards to uh, the chin strap, it sort of turns the topic question on its head a little bit because as I said, traditional chin straps are just a die cut piece of neoprene and the problem is that they don't work. Um, and so our design process um, was really uh, knowing that that was the case and then 
we just kept adding stuff to make it work. It, I don't know if it looks like it, but there's 21 pieces that are assembled here, and there's um, five different materials plus Velcro. So um, we just kept having to add and add and add, and then we finally got, and based on, um, I was the main test, test subject, so. <laughs> uh, it, and, uh, but then we'd send it out and we'd get feedback and we added more and more padding. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is that there's probably like a lot of simple stuff out there that could be a lot better, but you know, it may have to be substantially more complex than you know, what is super simple to make the improvement that's needed so it really works. I'm seeing a theme here where there's a little bit more complexity perhaps behind the scenes and then once it gets to the user, it'll actually work and it'll be more simple to the user. I see this also happen with transfer devices for uh, reconstituting drug powder and sterile water to create medications. I think uh, there's a lot of design and over-design in that space uh, and they kind of forget about the true fundamentals of user needs. Um, what is the reality of the user situation? And one reality that I've noticed in all the usability testing we do is that lay people really don't understand sterility. And if sterility is a critical aspect of the design of your product, um, you can't necessarily depend on a lay person to main, uh, maintain aseptic technique. Um, so that's just an example where you might need more components or um, change the design to kind of meet those needs. What are, uh, going back to that, what are some of the things that you've done to perhaps educate uh, people about uh, sterility? What are some techniques that you've used and your team has used? Um, so my team, we always follow the design mitigation hierarchy. So when possible, design out human error um, so that it's not possible at all. If for some reason that's not an option for you, guarding against the human error, and then thirdly, maybe warning through software mitigations, and finally, training and instructions. But the reality is, there's no way that you can ensure provision of training to all your end users. So most of the human factors validation that we do actually includes untrained lay people, because we have no case basically to the FDA to argue that these people will get training. So um, we do develop training programs, but typically when it comes to lay person interaction with a medical product since the FDA is going to force you uh, to demonstrate that untrained users are successful with your product anyways, we tend to not um, invest too much in uh, testing those training programs. We would rather just prove that lay people can use it successfully out of box. Sure. Anthony, I'm wondering if we can uh, start off with you for this question. Um, what is the most significant design challenge you or your team has had to overcome in order to make a device as simple as possible for the end user. And I want to add on to that and say, can you talk about designing or dealing with those challenges in a, I can't say post-COVID, but in a COVID world, in a, in a pandemic, during a pandemic? Um, so the design I'm going to speak about was done before COVID, but I could touch on yep. that at the end. Um, geez. Um, Well, let's talk about before COVID first with the design challenge. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So the design challenge was, um, it's funny. There is, um, like I said, there's an implant, there's a delivery system. Um, and there's also inside these implants, there's a little bit of a crimp, there's a crimper and it basically reduces the size of the implant. So you can insert it into the patient, it goes through the nostril, you load it into the delivery system. And one of the reasons why that has to be done is because the polymers are susceptible to creep. I'm not sure if you're aware of what creep is, but it's a, basically if you restrain, I mean, um, for example, a coronary stent, a metal coronary stent, it always springs back and forth. It's just like the hysteresis of the material. But polymers, if you hold them and you constrain them, they won't bounce back over time. You'll basically destroy the radial strength. Um, it just does not perform like a metal in any way. So in this specific instance, we had to keep the implant expanded inside the package. So it was sterilized, it was shelved, all expanded. And right before it was used, it was crimped by the physician. 
Um, the challenge with that was, is when we first started doing these polymers, uh, designing them, they're all boutique polymers, so they don't exist. There's no processing sheets for them. And we really had to figure out how they behaved over time um, without having a lot of experience with them. And we found out crimping them destroyed about 25% of the radial force. It's definitely necessary to give you apposition for good drug delivery. Um, but that little crimper um, that was used to crimp these um, implants as we were improving the materials, it took up so much time. It took up so much dedication because every single um, animal study, subsequent um, human studies, we were continually improving them so we can improve the, the performance of the implant itself. But it's funny, that was like, it took so much time to do that. Um, almost as much time as it took to design a delivery system and the, impl and the implant itself, excuse me. And then, well, now imagine doing that during the pandemic. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> like, what I'm noticing during the pandemic is lead times are, are nebulous, to say the least. Um, um, supply chain, getting custom products, um, getting products with zero rejects, it just, I mean, it's not happening anymore. I mean, there, a lot of companies are using help that they weren't relying on before. They lost a lot of their good help, but it's extremely challenging right now. Expect longer lead times, um, more expensive quotes, um, delays on fulfilling orders, and also reductions in quality. That's what I've experienced myself. Shannon. And if we're talking about changes caused by COVID-19, I think it really rang true in the last panel discussion. We are moving into the home, hospital to home, all the devices are headed there. Uh, so I think just that kind of change, and I think with that change, um, further integration between medical products and electronic health records, as well as telemedicine apps. So these historically non-medical device products, electronic health records, telemedicine apps, they're sort of getting like brought into the fold and you'll have to figure out how your software as a medical device plays nice with these platforms with this new paradigm. Um, so I really designed a lot of this at home and then we make this in Guatemala and um, in terms of COVID, it's not really on um, the design wasn't, and it's a new product. So uh, we hit the market just uh, weeks or months before COVID hit. Um, the thing that's been f uh, difficult for us is it's so easy to show somebody in person and if they're having a problem, you know, put it on in person and of course, there's so much less in-person stuff now that it makes our marketing much, much harder. Um, you know, I did a video and still uh, sometimes, you know, it's a very, people put it on too tight or whatever and you just can't be there to, you know, give them the feedback. Sure. That's how it's affected us. Sure. That kind of leads us into our next question. Um, how did you work with end users to ensure the design could simplify product use? wants to take a stab at that first? I can try. Okay. <laughs> so we do usability testing. We'll bring in end users, observe them, interact with the product, whether it be in our simulated surgical facility in San Jose or in a home use environment. And the primary thing to keep in mind is that what users say and what they will actually do in reality don't always align. So you need to know when you should listen to users and when you shouldn't. For example, at Intuitive Surgical, we got feedback that, okay, now the surgeon doesn't have to be in the sterile field to do the operation. They can actually be in the other room um, controlling the robot outside of the sterile field. So that's really great. Why not put cup holders on the surgeon console and that way the surgeon can drink his coffee while operating on the patient? Um, probably not the best idea, but a good example where our end users are saying something, but then as a design team, we're going to outsmart them, or maybe I shouldn't say that, maybe stay a couple steps ahead of them to kind of look at the full context of use to reveal what we should actually implement in our design. So it's all about tacit observation of your end users in a simulation to kind of predict the future, see what are these people actually going to do when this product is in their hands in reality. 
Shannon, do, do, do you think that's a pitfall that maybe some um, engineers, some companies don't do that? They just take the engineer, I mean, they just take the end user's word as gospel. Do you think that that happens? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and so I, this did uh, come up in the last panel discussion too, that your assumptions early on are essential. And I've seen companies so often make the wrong assumptions about who their users are or what their users think or how they would use the product, and they just go down this rabbit hole in the wrong direction, and at the very end of the process, maybe in human factors validation, that final study that they need to do for their FDA 510K, um, they might reveal something where they actually have to go back to the drawing board, this isn't gonna fly in the market. So um, it's really important to um, fail early and often through user-centered design, bring in those end users, have them use the product, maybe do a very small scale formative usability study and try to make those mistakes then before you're uh, tooling up your manufacturing or doing your verification testing. Anthony, I'm wondering what your experience has been with end users. So uh, um, implants are a little bit different. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, when you're putting a, si a, a sinus implant in, um, you do get feedback from the patient, but prior to that, you're doing a ton of studies um, on cadavers, um, synthetic cadavers, um, animal studies to get a good idea on the performance. Um, there's a whole lot of variability from patient to patient, um, left to right side of patient, um, as far as the anatomy of the sinuses go, very irregular. Um, so I think it's really important to know the, um, for this specific instance, to know the, I guess the overall boundaries of your design, like how, how big does it need to stay or how, how small does it need to be? Um, how easy is it to access the patient? But most of these questions um, for doing implant designs are answered um, way before the patient has them. You get a lot of answers like, oh, they felt pressure. Um, they can smell the device degrading. Um, things that you weren't expecting, um, but yeah, by then a lot of the design has been teased out and proven, so it's not as like hands-on as something that you would like have them try out and, and pass back to you. A lot of times they get these devices and you might get feedback within um, a day and you might never hear anything back. Um, something that is nice that you can see is you can actually see when these devices are working on patients. I've, I've worked with uh, one of the most um, Probably inspirational stories I have is um, when we were first working on these products, um, we were using um, the device, we were testing out the device on um, middle-aged patients around 60 to 65 years old. And you can tell, you can tell when you see a patient who hasn't been able to smell or taste for five years, it's obvious. I mean, you can tell somebody when they're sick. And when um, these products were implanted and the next day for follow-ups, the patient will come back and they're, they're feeling great. Uh, there, some of the women are wearing makeup for the first time. I've heard a, uh, one woman said, I, heard, I smelled roses today for the first time in six months. I smelled coffee. And it's really, um, it, it kind of chokes me up because um, when you really work on a product that gives you that kind of feedback that you're making that much impact in somebody's life, it's, that's the best kind of feedback that you can walk away with from a customer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so as I said, I had sleep apnea. And so I designed it for myself um, because of I sleep with my mouth open otherwise. Um, so I designed it for myself, and I, you know, we're a small company, and so we really didn't have much chance to test it. So we just, um, you know, I measured. There's three different sizes that are required, so that's another level of complexity. So basically, given it was COVID, um, pretty soon into the design process um, or into our um, production process. Um, you know, I tried on everybody who I had access to with COVID, which is, you know, family members, and we sent them out. And um, what I had to do is I was just sort of, I contacted everybody, the first hundred, and I followed up and asked them for feedback, including sizes. And if they engage with me, I, you know, I, asked them to send pictures, and I sometimes I'd ask them to Skype or um, Zoom so I could see them. Um, and I also just scanned the forums. There's a lot of sleep apnea forums, and if uh, this gets mentioned a fair amount, and uh, the people who have problems, I like to contact them 
um, we tend to get like um, in terms of rating scale, it's like people either give us a five or a one, and the ones are usually people who didn't something's wrong, they didn't understand what's going on and and how to use it. So you know, then I go and maybe change the instructions somewhat. But it's you know it's a tough process given that they just sort of go out into the void. It's not like your products where there's a doctor or an intermediary. Yeah. Sure, sure. Now I, I want to talk about this idea that we're now designing for consumers as opposed to, to patients. In some cases, not all, but in, but in some cases. But when we're designing for consumers, when when healthcare is getting toward um, toward that level. What about the payment codes? What about reimbursement? How is that handled when we're changing the dynamics of, of who we're designing for? Anyone want to take a I'll, I'll, yeah. So this doesn't have a code yet. I'll get it. But there's a problem with um, this that I haven't quite figured out how to deal with is that the code for chin straps, uh, they're for those simple pieces of neoprene, which costs like a dollar to make. And this costs us truth be told, around 850, just a really quite a complicated uh, thing. So even if we do get the code, I'm not that optimistic that that'll help us very much because it's, it's nominally, it's a chin strap, yeah. but it's really a medical device, whereas the others aren't and the codes aren't set up for that. So somehow I've got to deal with the whole bureaucracy of like, no, this is what people need. The chin straps do not work. This is a medical device. There's got to be like another code number for it or something. I'm, you know, I'm not sure how we'll deal with that problem. More and more I see regulatory context like that really stifling innovation, but that's always going to be the, the conflict. Uh, I think no matter what we do, uh, there's always going to be a conflict between regulatory framework and uh, innovation. Uh, but this year with COVID, and we develop a ton of in vitro diagnostics for detecting uh, COVID in your home, uh, whether molecular or antigen tests. And uh, I saw there was just so much confusion, specifically about CMS reporting of COVID cases. So uh, there was a misunderstanding among the community of developers that they needed to have an app to accompany their antigen tests. So that's like the buy next now for Abbott. Uh, and due to this misunderstanding that they needed to develop a whole app, as well as having this antigen lateral flow assay, it really slowed down a lot of development and killed a lot of companies. And as a result, we have a lot less options for home testing. I mean, everyone just keeps saying, oh, buy next now, buy next now. But there's actually five to 13 approved modalities for home use. I'm not seeing a whole lot of them present. But user-wise, most recently worked on the detect molecular product that is uh, soon to be available. Anyhow, it's a great example of just regulation stifling progress and innovation, especially when the regulations are confusing in some way. Um, reimbursement codes. Um, 15, 20 years ago, um, when you identified your patient, was the patient the doctor? Was the patient the actual patient um, themselves? Um, was a venture capitalist. Now the patient seems to me like it's turning into the reimbursement code. There's not too many companies who are going to like invest in a product where there's no reimbursement code, where they have to lay out the land to figure out how they're going to get paid. The products that make it to market already have established reimbursement codes, um, or they're well on to it, or they can tap into a reimbursement code. They have that idea in advance. I don't think there's too many companies that are pursuing products nowadays, no matter how innovative they are, without reimbursement codes that are kind of blazing the path so they can get paid immediately for their products. I think you just said something that was a quote, that was a tweet, the patient is the reimbursement code. I think that's, that's key, that's a very key factor. Yeah, that's great. I, I want to talk about the designing process, now I want to switch gears and talk about that. And, you know, engineers are artists. Uh, to a certain extent, you know. But it can sometimes be difficult to know what to keep on a device and what to exclude. How have you been able to make those decisions with the products that you're working on? Has it been a lot of wrangling, fist fights, or just pleasant conversations? How, how has it been, how has that been? Anyone wanna take a stab? Shannon? 
Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, we're really focused on user-centered design process in which we fail early and often. I think a common pitfall with robotic surgical development is draping. It's just the bastard child that's always forgotten. <laughs> and they, they're so focused on the mechanics and the technology and the surgeon, but then they forget, oh, we have to design these drapes so that people can maintain sterility as they're covering this giant piece of capital equipment in the operating room. And that is something that that companies tend to trip over in the end. But designing the, uh, putting those through the full user-centered design process of bringing in actual end users, so that isn't surgeons, it's uh, sterile technicians or uh, end users such as those, uh, circulating nurses, and having them have hands-on experience with prototypes so that as you're developing them, you have the proper indicators built into the design and unfolding aspects of the drapes um, to inform um, actually meeting their needs. Um, I, this is, I'm going to try not to laugh here. Um, it, it's funny, every time I design a product and um, send it out, um, I mean, we're usually doing studies, animal studies, cadaver studies, before anybody gets a look at it. But um, it's funny, marketing is always saying stuff like, well, we need tactile feedback. Like, the, the physician needs to know when it's disengaged, and like, all that's fair and good. Um, but I would say that's when you like grab that product, you take it back and you run because every time you add, I mean, everybody wants a blinking red light and a little buzzer to go off to indicate that what they're doing has happened. But um, going back to keeping it simple again, don't get distracted with that stuff. I mean, marketing has a lot of good suggestions. They really do. But on a ground level, when you're doing R&D, there's times when you have to keep focused on the end goal and that's... This, this implant's got to work, and a lot of times feedback that you get isn't really technical. It's, it's based on the staff that's trying to meet the needs of the customer versus really in the beginning stages, you're trying to have a technical success, and it's really important to stay focused, and um, I found out don't be afraid not to deliver. Don't be afraid not to deliver to marketing. I mean, I'm, like someone might be waiting for me after this and like throwing a shoe at me, but <laughs> Um, it's really important to stay focused because if you want to bring that product out and later on you can add the lights, you can add the little buzzers, but in the beginning, just make sure you can get something that works. Doctors and nurses are very intelligent people. They know how to make something work. There's a lot of verbal input to sift through as you're in this development process and you need to know what to not listen to. Just. Just last month, we were um, testing a molecular home test kit for COVID-19, and there was feedback from a user in a session where the cap was kind of difficult to um, push down and twist. And so they said, oh, we'll just add a label on this cap that says to push down and twist, because I, I thought you just pushed it down and it would click. And so instead, they're just kind of spinning it and spinning it and spinning it for five minutes. And um, in the end, we're not going to add a label to it. We need to design this to be pushed down and click, We because uh, it's not meeting the user's needs right now. Um, so I make a few products in Guatemala, and um, the design had to be, I mean, I could make this other places, but since I have um, infrastructure there and people I, you know, I love my crew and the people there. Um, so with the design, I did the best I could um, here. And then what was crucial is it's very hard to get stuff into Guatemala. It's easy to get stuff out. So. In the design process, it's like, okay, I know what I want, but what materials can I get there? Um, it is a, Guatemala is a very textile oriented country, so there's quite a lot of choices, but I had no idea until I went down there that, like, this is three layers of um, a mesh net, and I had no idea until we went down there and actually I could put my fingers on, you know, what kind of strap, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what, what width of strap. It had to have certain physical characteristics, but um, so that was really, I guess, one of the main ch um, challenges is, you know, figuring out what I could get there when I knew what the um, physics of it is. I'm glad you were able to figure that out before COVID. This product well, wouldn't have been yeah, developed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It would be much harder. Everything's much harder now. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I want to ask one more question um, and then give our audience a chance to, to perhaps ask some questions of their own. Um, but what is one recommendation or piece of advice that you can provide to medical engineers working in this space or divining, de designing a device right now? And when I say right now, I want to put this in the context of COVID and the pandemic oh. and all the things that we're dealing with. I know I threw a whammy in there. So. <laughs> I had an answer before COVID. Do you want my answer before? <laughs> okay. My answer before COVID is um, there's just an awful lot of, um, as I said, chin straps, you know, that push into the jaw joint don't work. How much misinformation is at all levels of um, the medical community about this is mind-boggling. The I could go on for quite a while, but there were studies that were done on the effectiveness of um, chin straps for, <clears throat> excuse me, for sleep apnea, and they did it with a chin strap that pushed directly into the jaw joint. And they go, oh, I mean, there was a little bit of confusion, but people published articles when the, f the physics in two seconds, you know the physics is wrong for how a chin strap would, you know, not lift the jaw. And it extends to the site of the NIH, where they cite these articles that are based on you know, a misunderstanding of physics. So um, I guess my advice is like, just be very skeptical. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding. You know, this can't be the only place where uh, people are just really out to lunch. Yes. If I had advice, um, I would say if you're in product development of medical devices, or SAMDs or combination products, uh, and you find yourself in meetings talking about training programs and training, you're very likely not addressing the true root cause of the issue at hand. If you're in your development process and you're focused on training, you're probably having the wrong conversations. Uh, for example, at, um, at UserWise, we, we uh, ran the human factors program for MEMIC, which is a robotic sur surgical system that got a 510K a year or so ago, two years ago. And there was sort of a fundamental question there is, um, can uh, surgeons operate in two dimensions? Because intuitive surgical paradigm has always been 3D uh, and having depth perception. So there's this fundamental question of, can they operate within a 2D environment? And the answer turned out to be yes. But if, if they were in, even though it's a robotic surgical system, if they're talking about surgeon training, can a surgeon learn how, that's the wrong conversation. You need to have a high fidelity, simulated use environment where you answer that question with untrained users. And if untrained users are unable to properly operate um, without depth perception, there's your answer. All the training in the world isn't going to bail you out of that situation. Um, as far as medical devices go, um, the, the strategy I would take now with COVID is something I've like, um, it was my strategy before, is try to stay away from customization. Try to stay away from customized materials, um, customized components. Um, say, for example, if you're doing an extrusion, find out how um, readily available the resins are. You might find out that you're waiting in line for six weeks just to get a resin to start an extrusion. Um, use the same material as much as possible. Um, don't get tricky. I mean, you'd be surprised. Like a lot of people say, well, we have friction here or You'd be surprised with like very low forces. It really doesn't matter if you have similar materials. Um, and when you're picking um, the overall dimensions of your product, um, this is like a really, um, yeah, look in catalogs like McMaster Car, Granger. Look at hypo tube sizes that they sell off the shelf. And there's going to come a day where you might want to get your custom extrusion or custom hypo tube, but you can't. Um, it was that way before, and it's even more so now. Get a, find, use materials that you can find in a catalog and bring them in. It really helps out a lot. Use a common size. If it's up for grabs, well, should the dimension of this delivery, uh, of this hypo tube on the delivery system be a quarter of an inch or whatever, three millimeters or three and a half? Find out what's readily available in the catalog and pick that size if it really doesn't matter. And I know a lot of these devices are high tech, 
and we're unfortunately pushed down the alley of doing everything custom, but it really doesn't have to be custom. You don't have to do custom springs. You don't have to do custom materials for everything. So it's, it's a little piece of advice I could give that might help a lot in the end. Sure, sure. Now I'm wondering if there are any questions from the audience. Anyone have any questions, comments? Yeah, one up here, Lord. Uh, hello. Uh, <clears throat> uh, ma many times uh, there are many options, you know, what to develop first, uh, what features, how do you prioritize? How do you like evaluate what, what features should be first and what features should be second and, and third and so on? I care a lot about this question. So I always used a I always use a risk-based approach to design. And that is kind of the whole point of what the FDA is saying in their human factors guidance that was published in 2016. They're saying focus on the critical tasks, the aspects of the design that could actually cause patient harm. And once you've ironed out all the human error associated with those aspects, then you can start worrying about these other aspects that might be more related to ease of use. But if you don't solve those problems where human error could actually cause harm to patients or users, um, then your product probably isn't going to pass the final phases of human factors testing. Um, so the way that we drive design efforts is to have a use-related risk analysis where we catalog all the potential human error associated with the product and we're able to prioritize based on severity. And that way the product development team knows which tasks or features uh, they need to focus on. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I would say you have to start somewhere. Um, Rapid prototyping is really nice. If you're going to do a delivery system, if you're trying to do something that's ergonomical, um, start with your base. Start with whatever that overall um, is, what that device is, and then see if you can use it. See what you you need to do with that product, and you might have to like release something or pull a sheath back somewhere. But it's really important to get. Like when I can't get started, I'm like, I think in my head, what does it look like? Just make what it looks like. Make just like a dummy. And then, like, it's like clay. Just then add things to it as you go. I mean, that was a hard question, but there you go. <laughs> Software, we tend to use something as simple as like PowerPoint, where we'll show um, potential screens to end users and get their input. I would just say, start with the hardest stuff first. Like if you can't solve the hardest issues, you might as well know that right away. Well, if there are no further questions, then that concludes. Oh, I think we have time for one last one really quick. How often did you guys fail? Like, can you give an example of a failed uh, design that you had before you came up with the one that I brought you on stage here today. Um, uh, I've got um, three products on the market, and um, I've been, got 11 patents just in the US. Um, and so that means eight of them <laughs> failed. And um, the unifying aspect of it is um, teaching the consumer the advantages. And I'll just give you a real quick, well, a real quick example. I invented a pinky slide for guitar. It's the best pinky slide, but it's like totally different. And it's just really hard to, if you do something really different, um, the hard part for me, I found, is not developing something really different. It's like getting everybody on board and teaching them. And there's a, I like to tell this story. I think it's true, but it may be apocryphal. Um, when the leash for the surfboard was invented, it took 10 years before people started using it. It makes so much sense, but people are really slow to adapt, um, adopt. Um, and it was the same with the fin on the surfboard. It took like 10 years from when people started putting fins on surfboards until it became common. Um, so um, 
My, the failure, you invent something new, you make it really hard on yourself is um, the upshot. And it's really just people are slow to, to adopt to new things. We are about over, well, we are over time now. If you could do it 30 seconds, sum it up in 30 seconds. Yeah, which, when's the best time to get a flat tire? It happens to us all, when's the best time? When it's in your garage, and when it's in front of the house, when you don't have to like drive the car back 15 minutes, fail in the beginning, fail quick. And failing is great. Like if you can get it out of the way, as soon as you start, don't be afraid to fail. Because the, the only way that you can make failure better is by adding quickness to it all. And like pivoting and getting back on the right track. 15. I can't say it better than that. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you all for coming out. We appreciate it.